you know that to take a, to get a picture of the Nautilus, you have to cheat. <coughs> Nautiluses live down 150 meters or so, 120 meters, 150, 200, 300. Uh, the average scuba diver, which I am, does not go down. Nowadays, with tech, it is possible. You can go down to 150 meters and get your picture if you are good enough. Uh, some even surface after. But I never, or almost never, go beyond 40 meters. That's already a lot. I spend most of my time at 15, 20 meters. I have time, that's what most life is anyway. So, my first field guide on the Indo Pacific, which is going to be succeeded soon by the newer and hopefully better one, I wanted a picture of a Nautilus. And the only way is to ask a fisherman, can you set a trap for me, please, in 120 meters depth? You put some, uh, some crabs inside or some chicken legs, and then hopefully when we hold it up next morning, we will have some, some Nautilus. But this was in New Caledonia. There are half a dozen Nautilus species. This is the New Caledonia recognizable by its, uh, its belly button there. So all others, for example, the one from, uh, from uh, Palau, it's completely smooth here. It doesn't have the belly button. And so I go to the aquarium of Numia where they have these things, but I, I don't want pictures from an aquarium. I want it in, in a real environment. So I asked them, could I borrow a Nautilus from you? And they said, I said, I'll bring it back, but I want a picture for my underwater field guide, you know. I'm, I'm world famous for my underwater field guide, so do I have to give me a <laughs> They said, who are you anyway? And, and then uh, I, I said, I just for no way, no way, no. We don't give you any notice. You might lose it. I said, well, I, I'll be very careful. No, 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 no. But if you want, you come back tomorrow and you can go on our research vessel and we'll lend you a Nautilus and our chief diver will keep an eye on our precious Nautilus. I said, well, okay, that's a deal. So I meet the chief diver and he says, tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock you show up. And I show up at 8 o'clock and he says, you are maybe very lucky. I said, why? He said, well, this morning I chose two, they had about two dozen of them. I, I chose two that looked pretty, uh, pretty nice yesterday evening, I put them in a bucket, and this morning when I came in, they were mating. And mating takes hours. So if we are lucky, they won't separate when we put them in the sea, and maybe you can get a picture of mating Nautilus in a natural environment. There it is. Wow. One year later, New mm -hmm. Caledonia issued a stamp, a postal stamp, wow. with this picture. Wow. <laughs> Well, this is the one I talked about when we were in the car. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also the moment. I mean, this is, this is in, in Florida. This is the manatee. It's the Atlantic equivalent of the dugong. And uh, so I was snorkeling there. And he was this moderate calf. And the calf suddenly peeps around mother's shoulder. Who is there? And mother says, don't worry. That's just another snorkeler. You will see many more of them. The moment. The moment. Getting pictures of dolphins is not very complicated. The problem with dolphins is that they swim, they swim fast, they move all the time. So how do you get your right composition with the diagram or the other thing? Uh, well, you shoot a lot, you miss a lot. And if you are lucky, yeah. there is one good picture of it. I must be honest, also from time to time. <laughs> uh, this, this dolphin is semi-wild. It's not in a sea aquarium. This is in the Bahamas. It lives in uh, a closed bay. Uh, they get fed and they have their uh, feeders, trainers, I don't know what, what to call them, but for instance, this, this, this lady. And they are very, very familiar. And then they go out to sea. They open the, the, the net that closes the bay. They go out with, uh, with a, a dinghy, with an outboard engine, and the dolphins follow them. They're free to go. If they don't want to go back, well, we have just have lost one of our dolphins. But they don't. So that's why I call them semi-wild. They are not in prison. Uh, but they are very friendly with human beings because they, they have 
a lot of advantages of being a human being. This is so. This is they live in the bay that is, that is big. They have, they have space. It's uh, so. I'm not. I'm not against the practice like that. But one of the things they have learned, and they are rewarded with fish, of course. One of the things they have learned to please divers who come, scuba divers who come to the Bahamas, is to kiss the the, 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 the guide. And, well, it's a moment. It's a moment okay. for what it's worth. But here's nothing special. These the platypus, what are they called in English? Bad uh, fish. Bad fish, right? Uh, these bad fish, they, they swim together. Well, for me, this was just the right moment when they, they look like twins and I, I diagonal again, so I'm happy. And um, this, is, this is the moment when a giant clam shows its in, intimate parts. They're very shy, they don't like to show their intimate parts, like the gills inside. So you must be very friendly, talk to them slowly. Then maybe they will open up. Maybe. <laughs> Land based trains. Very famous place. Uh, this is the Bobbit Worm. Ever heard of the Bobbit Worm? Yes. Ah. yes. Ever seen the Bobbit Worm? Yes. Well, don't. Our Indonesian field guide said one day, You want to go for a night dive? Uh, always. Have you ever seen the bobbit worm? The what? The bobbit worm. What is it? Ha! I'll show you. So he takes you at night out on the black flat sand, and there are holes this size, uh, like like mouse holes. And he stops at one and gets a piece of rotten fish out of a little plastic bag and puts it on the end of a bamboo stick and wiggles it above the hole and suddenly creeps. Here comes this huge worm, because the hole is this in, in, in diameter, so is the worm, and it shoots out, look at its jaws, it's like this, and they, 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 they catch the piece of fish, go back into the, into the hole again. Scary, I mean, if you want to make a scary movie, Bobby <laughs> Um I haven't seen it all, but, but down to it must be at least one meter long. I mean, that's quite a worm. And you know why it is called the Bobbit Worm? Funny story. Here was an American couple, John Wayne Bobbit. John Wayne, first name. American, now, famous actor. We call our son John Wayne. He'll be a nice boy. No, he wasn't. He married, he married Lorena. And John Wayne came home every other night, having drunk too much booze, uh, forcing his wife to perform things that she didn't want to perform. And one day, she had enough of it. And while he was fast asleep after having forced her again one day to do what she didn't want to do, uh, she went to the kitchen, took out a kitchen knife, and cut off his penis. This is a true story, okay? This, this, is, this is in the, in, in the, in, in the, in the records. And she went out a little bit panicky with still this thing in her left hand and she stepped in, in their car and she drove away and some miles from home she threw the thing away, oh, disgusting thing, and bleedy at all. And she, uh, she drove along for a little bit more and then she turned herself in at the police station. And she said, look, uh, this is what I've done. Um, I don't like the guy, but..." I'm afraid that John Wayne is bleeding to death. So they sent a rescue squad and medics, and uh, they sent another team to find back what was lost uh, somewhere along the road. They found it. It was soon back. But I don't think he was sexually performant after that story. <laughs> and the bobbit worm, the female, does exactly the same with the male after mating. She cuts off the parts. That's why. <laughs> Enough biology. No, no, even more biology. Um, well, you know, um, cardinal fish, they are mouth breeders, so they keep the eggs once they're fertilized. It's the male who does it. There are nice males too, not, uh, not all of them John Wayne. <laughs> um, and uh, so he keeps a bowl of fertilized eggs in his mouth until the eggs hatch and the hatchlings can 
escape freely, but they are well guarded by dead during the time of uh, Maitri. That's one of those other things. Uh, cleaning fish, they, 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 they are very difficult. They, they move, impossible to get a picture of uh, cleaning fish. This is a series of 20 pictures. 19 could be thrown away right away. And then there was the lucky shot, which I showed. Sometimes I'm not honest. I say, it's easy. Take a pic. <laughs> Wait for the right moment. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. And I, I, I love details. Details of fins, details of eyes, details of coral. Uh, I, I love the tiny stuff. But on this tiny stuff, this is the, the eye of a, a tiny, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, well, tiny fish, the Mediterranean. But on the eye, there is this copy pot. It's a what? A copy pot, a little crustacean. So it has. It's still to the right, it's to antennae to, to the left, and the body in the middle. That's tiny. I didn't see it when I took the picture. I saw it afterwards on, on my computer screen. Ah, there's something more. Here, this, this, this is an isopod, and uh, it's mean. I mean, this one is sitting on the tail of uh, a cardinal fish, and you see it has got its, its legs really buried in the flesh, and it's sucking blood, and it's eating flesh. It's a mean. But biologically, it's interesting. And that is the flamboyant cuttlefish, one of the rare cuttlefish that does not swim very often, but that walks like an elephant on the sea bottom, looking for prey, small crustaceans. And this is one of the examples where patients pick. You wait you will get it. The flamboyant cuttlefish wow. hunting in the act of catching. You can't see what it has caught. I haven't seen it. But suddenly it's, you know, it's a decapod. It has ten tentacles, eight normal tentacles, and two catching tentacles, which are very long. And it goes, yes, and I've got you. And munch, munch, munch. The same cuttlefish lays eggs like all cuttlefish, or all cephalopods, or most other animals, and uh, these eggs are put into hiding. Now, in former days, a million years ago, they put their eggs under rocks, under, under dead shells, but since Indonesians are around who eat coconut, you have half coconut lying all around over the sea bottom, and when before I took this picture, it was the other way around. And in the shelter of the dome of the, of the uh, coconut were these cuttlefish eggs. Now when you look from close by, oh. you can see the little cuttlefish swimming inside. It's ready to hatch. We, I go back to the previous one. Here, they are still, most of them at least, they are white. But just prior to hatching, suddenly the chromatophores, the colored cells, they they switch on, and it has already the colors of the adult one. They are five millimeters big there. And then you can see it move inside the egg, and suddenly they are out wow. and start their life. So pretty. Patience pays. This is a garden eel. Well, there are not many divers around here, so let me tell you, you want to see a garden eel from close up, forget it. Garden eels are little eels that stick out of the sand in tiny holes, and they move all, everybody in the same direction with the current, and they eat plankton. And when you move closer towards them, there are no garden eels anymore close to you, but five meters onwards, they are there. So Okay, here they are gone. I move very slowly to the other ones. But they are gone, and you look back, and they have got, got out again. Yeah. This is Bali. Yeah. And on a sandy slope, there were thousands of gardeners. Morning dive, I tried to get pictures of them. Hopeless, as usual. Afternoon dive, same spot. I don't even attempt to take pictures of uh, gardeners anymore. And 
we swim along the slope, and I've already passed this one. Hey, that one didn't retract. Hey, it is still there. Is it dead? No, it wasn't dead. It was moving. So I moved closer, and it went, whoop, I thought, okay, another one lost, but let's try it. And then, I don't know, it probably had smoked the carpet or something like that. And it didn't get further into its hole. Now, this is the picture that I've waited 30 years to be able to make. It. Am I not patient? Lucky, lucky to find one garden eel who did not retract. I took it from, from this close. <laughs> and then, since we are talking art, we can talk abstract art. Who cares what it is? I'm not a biologist after all, I'm an artist. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you even what it is, although everybody has recognized that this is a C squared. But I'm not going to tell you. Um, nobody cares that these are the scales of a squirrel fish. This is just an abstract picture. C squares are beautiful, always. I love C squares. Sometimes I regret that I did my PhD on Gorgonians and other soft corals. But they are still nicer than the sequence. Now what's this? Who knows? Topaz. Flounder. It's a flounder, right? Great. It's a flounder. It's just part of the skin of a flounder and it has these marks on the back. They look like three little creatures with eyes. That's probably what is meant by it. But never get anthropocentric about this. I mean, it's not a flounder that says, I am going to, to, to divert attacks uh, from my front part where it is dangerous for me. I'm rather putting uh, some uh, coy little, little creatures on my back. It doesn't work like that. Natural selection. Read Darwin again. Natural selection has done it. Um, haphazard mutations. And those flounders who had got things like that on their back survived better than those who didn't. And so, in the end, everybody had. Not the same story here, just the skin of a uh, sea cucumber. Or a detail of a sea star. But it's not about it. It's just pretty picture. Filefish, school filefish, lionfish, pufferfish. parrotfish. But it's just about shapes and colors. Another puffer, I guess. Now this one, I mean, okay, this is uh, a lagoon surrounded by coral reefs seen from the air, but of course that is not what it is. Who knows what it is? Who can give yes. a guess? It's a nice one, huh? nobody knows. This, sorry? No, it's not an eye. It's, it's the opening in the mantle of a giant clam. The exhaling opening. Oh, this is where the water flows out. Or just a fin of a parrotfish. Or just some, the Italians call it tutti frutti, uh, a mixture of nice sweet things to eat. Uh, some algae, some tiny colonial sea squares, the green ones, the yellow ones, the red ones. It, it is nothing really, it's just a picture. Or even my own air bubbles got stuck in the ceiling of an underwater cave. Looks like uh, quicksilver, like mercury. And then this last question. Is it allowed to not only have your pictures, but do something with it? Well, I go back. What did I do here? I reframed it. I mean, for 40 years I've been taking pictures on 30, 36, 25 millimeter film. 25 by 36 millimeter, 2 by 3. That was the format. You didn't have the choice. Unless you had bought 
the camera of Hans Haas, which was 6 by 6 centimeters square. But then you had square, you had not rectangular. Now I can get rectangular even more stretched than the format of my camera. I just crop a little bit. I, this part wasn't interesting, so I crop it off and I get a nice picture because I reframe it. What's wrong with that? We all, nowadays in, in underwater photography competitions, I've been at quite a lot of juries of underwater photography competitions, and in some festivals they say, no Photoshop allowed. I say, why, why is this? I mean, 100 years ago we reframed already in the dark room. We took a negative and we just printed the part that we wanted. And sometimes we cropped it exactly the same way. What's wrong with it? Every famous photographer has done it, always. No, no, it's not allowed. Okay, fine. Um, here we have a nice example of where Photoshop gets in. This is a picture of a juvenile lionfish. Okay, nothing wrong with the picture. Not really exciting either. Uh, as, a, as a picture, um, as a picture from a field guide, I wouldn't like it too much because this is so black. It doesn't show the animal in its natural surroundings anymore. It is in its natural It doesn't show. Uh, but then as a picture, there is a little bit of natural surrounding that I don't like. Well, you can erase it, you know. You, you copy this part of black on there, and the algae are gone. Look, look, I'm going to do it. Poof. Looks much better, doesn't it? Except that... There is some emptiness here and there, which I don't like. Let's crop it. There we go. Oh, I even have got my diagrams. It was already in the picture when I made it. And I don't know whether I show it on the next one. Probably not, no. Um, but there were also in this picture uh, a thing that is always annoying when you take underwater pictures. There are particles in the water. Water is not distilled water. It's the water. It has it has dust particles. And when you use your your strobe invented by Remy Coffin in 1950, you light all these little particles, and you have all these little white specks. When you're very lucky, there are a few of them, and when you're unlucky, it's full of them. <laughs> uh, uh, when you are very good at, uh, at, at uh, controlling your floatability, you have few particles. And when you are a lousy diary, you have lots of them. Well, it all depends on the surroundings as well. But you can you can take them away by Photoshop. Oh, that's not fair. There were particles in the world. Yeah, well, I don't like it. I take them away. <laughs> <laughs> now this one. This is the uh, Palau um, Nautilus. So it has, does not have this, this hole in it. And they were caught for us, they were caught in 150 meters depth, they put the cage down there and with some chicken legs inside. And next morning we had about 20 nautiluses. It's great. So I took one, there were other photographs who took another one, and I toyed around with my uh, with my nautilus before releasing them so that they could go back to the depths where they live. And I was very excited. I was so excited that I got everything wrong. The colors on this picture. They were horrible. The, the water looked green, the, the, the nautilus looked green. It doesn't look right. But in black and white, ah, not bad after all. That's Photoshop for you. Your, your, your color picture is lousy. Maybe it works as a black and white one. But, but I, it, it, it happens to me often that I take pictures because I know I'm going to make them black and white. And this is square. This is not two to three. I'm not obliged. I can make it square. Looks like a picture made by Hans Hans. <laughs> Almost. And this, of course, nobody has ever seen. I have taken pictures of models, portraits, nudes, where I projected the abstract details of fish on their face or their bodies. So projector with an underwater slide projected on a face. I took a picture of that, then I cut out in Photoshop this fish portrait and superimposed it on that portrait. This has nothing to do with reality, this has to do with creativity, like it or not. I mean, if you say, I, I don't like this, I don't want this, okay, don't do it. 
But it is possible. At least it is possible. Artistic. Yes, maybe. <laughs> um, that was it. Thank you very much. You have been a very nice. And I don't, I don't know who this is, but that's the Baramundi. You can recognize it right away. That's the Baramundi <laughs> sea bus. <laughs> okay, so now we have uh, time for Q&A. If anyone wants to ask questions, now's the time. We have about 10 minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Fine with me. So by the way, two hours if you like. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, I'm not that into your uh, photography because I'm only using a GoPro. Um, but I, I find the colour very strange when you take like The colours of what I have shown to you look strange, is that I what know, you know, my photo, when I take colour, look green and blue, not the real colour, what I see. Ah, so. that's a very clever thing you say. Uh, I'm not cynical, it's really clever. Um, your GoPro isn't equipped with artificial lighting, right? You just use your GoPro as it is in a watertight house.